No one should put this many hours into work. This is not good. And people should not work this hard. I'm not, they should not do this. This is too, it's very painful. Painful in what sense? It's, it, hurts my, it hurts my brain and my heart. Particularly if you're starting a company, you need to work super hard. So what, what does super hard mean? Um, well, when my brother and I were starting our first company, uh, in, instead of getting an apartment, we just rented a, a small office and we slept on the couch. Uh, and we, we showered at the, the YMCA. And uh, we're, we're so hot up, we had just one computer. So the, 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 the website was up during the day uh, and I was coding at night. Seven days a week, all the time. Um, and I, I uh, sort of briefly had a girlfriend in that period, and in order to be with me, she had to sleep in the office. So, uh, work hard, like, it, it, I mean, every waking hour. That's, that's the, the thing I would, I would say, if, if you, particularly if you're starting a company. Um, and, I mean, if you do simple math, say, like, okay, if somebody else is working 50 hours and you're working 100, uh, you'll get twice as, done, as much done in the course of a year as the, as, uh, the other company just work like hell. I mean, you just have to put in, you know, 80 hour, 80 to 100 hour weeks every week. And it's then a lot of work. That, that, that all those things improve the odds of success. Um, right. I mean, if, 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 if other people are putting in 40 hour work weeks and you're putting in 100 hour work weeks, then even if uh, you're doing the same thing, you know that in, in one year you will achieve what they achieve. You, you, you will achieve in four months what it takes them a year to achieve. What was your biggest failure and how did it change you? We, we almost did die at SpaceX actually. So we, I budgeted for, for three flights. Um, I mean technically I, I did have a plan where I, I had, a, had, this, had the money from PayPal. I had like about 180 million from PayPal. And I thought, you know, I'll, I'll allocate half of that to SpaceX and Tesla and SolarCity. And, um, that should be fine. I'll have 90 million likes, just lots, you know. Uh, but but then what happened is um, things cost more and took longer than than I thought. So I had a choice of either put the rest of the money in or the companies are going to die. Um, and it's like so I, put, I ended up putting all the money in and, and borrowing money for rent from friends. Um, 2008 was brutal. Um, yeah, 2008, we had the third consecutive failure of the Falcon 1 rocket for SpaceX. Um, Tesla almost went bankrupt. We, we closed our financing round 6 p.m. Christmas Eve, 2008. It was the last hour of the last day that it was possible. We would have gone bankrupt two days after Christmas otherwise. SpaceX is alive by the skin of its teeth, so is Tesla. Um, if, if things had just gone a little bit the other way, it, both companies would be dead. And I, and I had, like one of the most difficult choices I've ever faced uh, in life was, was in 2008. Um, and um, I think I had uh, like a, maybe $30 million left, or 30 or $40 million left in 2008. And I had two choices. I could put it all into one company, and then the other company would definitely die, um, or split it between the two companies. And, but if I split it between two companies, then both might die. Um, and you know, when you put your blood, sweat, and tears into creating something, or building something, it's like a child. Um, and so it's like, which one am I going to let one starve to death? I couldn't bring myself to do it, so I, put, I, I split the money between the two. Fortunately, thank goodness, uh, they both came through. Tesla really faced a severe a uh, th threat of death uh, due to the Model 3 production ramp. Essentially, the, the company was bleeding money like crazy, and, and just, if, if we didn't solve these problems in a very short period of time, uh, we would die. Uh, and it was extremely difficult to solve them. How close to death did you come? We, yeah, within single-digit weeks. 22 hours a day, or like, what, how many uh, hours? Just working, yeah, so seven days a week, sleeping in the factory. Uh, I worked everywhere from the, I worked in the, I worked in the paint shop. General Assembly, body shop. Do you ever worry about yourself imploding? Like it's just yeah, too yeah. much? Absolutely. I think failure is bad. Um, I don't think it's good. Um, mm -hmm. But if, if, if something's 
important enough, then you, you do it even though the risk of failure is high. Were you a little naive when you thought I'll just I can easily build build an electric car and, and a rocket? I didn't think it would be easy. Um, I th like I said, I thought they would probably fail. Um, but you know, like creating a company is almost like having a child. So it's sort of like, how do you say your child should not have food? So one, once you have the company, you have to feed it and nurse it, yeah. and <laughs> take care of it, of it, even if it. It ruins you? Yeah. But uh, suppose there were some tough times in uh, 2008, end of 2008. How did you get through that period of crisis? Yeah. Can we just break for a second? Sure, 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 of course. Yeah. You want to wait a little while? Yeah, I sure hope it was worth it. Sure hope so. Me. Sure hope it was worth it. Well, there's a ton of failures along the way, that's for sure. Like I said, for, as, I, as I said, for, for SpaceX, the first three launches failed. And uh, we, we, actually, we were just barely able to scrape together enough parts and, and money to do the, the fourth launch. If that fourth launch had failed, we would have been dead. So, multiple failures along the way. Um, I, I tried very hard to, to get the right expertise in for, for SpaceX. I tried hard to, to find a great uh, chief engineer for the rocket, but it, not, the good chief engineers wouldn't join, and the bad ones, well, there was no, no point in hiring them. So I ended up being chief engineer of the rocket. Um, so if I could have found somebody better, then we would have maybe had less than three failures. When you had that third failure in a row, did you think, I need to pack this in? Never. Why not? I don't ever give up. I mean, I'd have to be dead or completely incapacitated. You know, there are American heroes who don't like this idea. Neil I, Armstrong, yeah. Gene Cernan have both testified against commercial spaceflight in the way that you're developing it. And I wonder what you think of that. I was very sad to see that uh, because those guys are you know, those guys are heroes of mine, so it's really tough. You know, I, I wish they would come and visit and, and see the hardware that we're doing here. And, and I think that would change their mind. They inspired you to do this, didn't they? Yes. And to see them casting stones in your direction. It's difficult. Did you expect them to cheer you on? So they're hoping they would. Something that can be helpful is fatalism, uh, to some degree. Um, if you just if you just accept the probabilities, um, then that diminishes fear. Uh, so, um, when starting SpaceX, I thought the odds of success were less than 10%, um, and I just accepted that actually probably I would just lose lose everything. Um, but that maybe we'd make some progress if we could just move the ball forward. Even if we died, maybe some other company could pick up the baton and move and keep moving it forward um, so that would still do some good um, yeah same with Tesla I thought you know, the odds of a car company succeeding were extremely low in creating these companies we thought that we would be successful um, I thought that the most likely outcome was failure um, but but it was still worth doing even though the, the odds of success were low in fact even for, for, for SpaceX the Originally, what I started doing was not creating a rocket company, but, but actually was going to do um, a small mission to Mars, which was just a philanthropic mission where you would send a, a small greenhouse with seeds and dehydrated gel. And the, would, um, upon landing, hydrate the gel, and you'd have this cool picture of green plants on a red background. And the public tends to respond to precedents and superlatives. So this would be the first life on Mars, furthest that life's ever traveled. Um, and you'd have this great money shot of green plants on a red background. So, um, yeah, I thought that would, that would get people's attention. So, um, but, but the expectation for that was, was no return. So the I, I thought would, we, we wouldn't get any, uh, you know, just spend the money on that and it wouldn't, wouldn't happen. If, if you're creating a company or if you're joining a company, uh, the most important thing is to uh, 
attra is to attract great people. So either be with, join a group that's amazing that you really respect, or if, you, if you're building a company, you've got to gather great people. I mean, all a company is is a group of people that have gathered together to create a product or service. And so, depending upon how talented and hardworking that group is, and the degree to which they are focused uh, cohesively in, in a good direction, that will determine the success of the company. So. Do everything you can to, to gather great people uh, if, if you're creating a company. Um, then I'd say focus on, on signal over noise. Um, a lot of companies get, get confused. They, they spend money on things that don't actually make the product better. So for example, at, at Tesla, we've, we've never spent any money on advertising. Um, we, we put all of the money into R&D and, and manufacturing and design to try to make the car as good as possible. Um, and uh, I, I think that's, that's, that's the way to go. So if, if for, for any given company, just can, can keep thinking about, are these efforts that people are, are expending, are they resulting in a better product or service? And if they're not, stop those efforts. Starting a business, I'd say number one is have a high pain threshold. <laughs> that's it. Um, there's a friend of mine who's got a good saying, which is that starting a company is like eating glass and staring into the abyss. Okay, that's, um, that's generally what happens. Because um, when you first start a company, there's lots of optimism and things, things are great. And then, so happiness at first is high. Then you encounter all sorts of issues uh, and happiness will steadily decline. <laughs> and then you'll go through a whole world of hurt. <laughs> that's, and then eventually, You'll, if you succeed, and in most cases you will not succeed, um, and, and Tesla almost didn't succeed, came very close to failure, um, then if, if you succeed, then after a long time you will finally get back to happiness. You've got to make sure that, that, you, that whatever you're doing is a great product or service. It, it has to be really great. And I go back to what I was saying earlier where um, if you're a new company, I mean, unless it's like some new industry or, or new market that, if it's an untapped market, or then then uh, you have more ability to. You, this this the standard is lower for your product or service. But if you're entering anything where there's an existing marketplace against large entrenched competitors, then your product or service needs to be much better than theirs. It can't be a little bit better because then you put yourself in the shoes of the consumer. And they say, why would you buy it as a consumer? You're always going to buy the trusted brand unless there's a big difference. So a lot of times, uh, you know, an entrepreneur will come up with something which is only slightly better. Um, and it's, it's not, it can't just be slightly better. It's got to be a lot better. A well thought out critique of whatever you're doing is as valuable as gold. Um, and you should seek that from everyone you can, but particularly your friends. Um, usually your friends know what's wrong, but they don't want to tell you because they don't want to hurt you. It doesn't mean your friends are right, uh, but very often they are right. Um, and you at least want to listen very carefully to what they say. And to everyone, if you're looking for, basically, you should take the approach that, that you're wrong. Um, you know, that, that, that you, the entrepreneur, are wrong. Your goal is to be less wrong. The advice I'd give to people starting companies, to entrepreneurs in general, is um, r really focus on making a product that your customers love. Um, and it, it's so rare that you can buy a product and, and you love the product when you, when you bought it. The, this is, this is, there are very few uh, things that fit into that category. And if you, if you can come up with something like that, your, your business will be successful for sure. I think uh, really uh, an, an obsessive uh, nature with respect to the quality of the product um, it is very important. Uh, yeah, so, you know, being obsessive compulsive is, is a good thing in this context. Um, uh, r really, r really liking what you do, what, whatever area that you get into, um, given that, you know, even if you're, if you're the best, the best, there's always a chance of failure. So I think it's important that you really like whatever you're doing. Um, if, if you don't like it, life is too short. Um, you know, I, I'd say, if, if, and, and also, if, if, you, if you like what you're doing, you think about it even when you're not working. I mean, you're, it'll just, it, it's, it's something that your mind is drawn to. 
Um, and, and if you don't like it, you just really can't make it work, I think. When I was young, I, I, uh, I didn't really know what I was going to do uh, when, when I got older. Um, people kept asking me, and, and, um, but, but then eventually I thought that the idea of inventing things would be, would be really cool. And uh, the reason I thought that was because um, I, I read a quote from Arthur C. Clarke, which said that a, um, a sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And, and that's really true. Um, if, you th if you go back, say, 300 years, the things that we take a, um, a sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And, and that's really true. Uh, being able to see over long distances, being able to communicate, uh, being able to see over long distances, being able to communicate, having um, effectively, uh, w with, with the internet, uh, a, 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 um, in, in times past. In fact, I think it actually goes beyond that because there are many things that we take for granted today that weren't even imagined in, in times past. They weren't even in the realm of magic. So it, it actually goes, goes beyond that. So I thought, well, you know, if, if, if I can do some of those things, basically if, if, if I can advance technology, then that, that's like magic and that would be really cool. Um, and the, the, I always had sort of a slight existential crisis because I was trying to figure out what, what does it all mean? Like what's the purpose of things? And um, I came to the conclusion that if, if we can advance the, 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 the knowledge of the world, if we can do things that expand the scope and, and, and scale of consciousness, then we're better able to ask the right questions and become more enlightened, and, and that's really the only way forward. So, uh, so, so I, I, I studied uh, physics and business because I figured in order to do a lot of these things, you, you need to know how the universe works and you need to know how, how, how the economy works. Um, and you also need to be able to bring a lot of people together to work with you to create something because it's very difficult to do something as, as an individual if it's, if it's a significant technology. So I, uh, I originally came out to, to California to uh, try to figure out how to improve the energy density of, of, um, uh, of, of electric vehicles, basically to, to try to figure out if there was an advanced capacitor that, that, that could serve as an alternative to batteries. And um, that was in 95, and uh, that's also when the internet uh, started to happen. And, and it, I, I, I thought, well, I can either uh, pursue this, tech, this technology where success may, be, may not be one of the possible outcomes, which is always tricky, um, or uh, participate in the internet and, and be, be part of it. And, and I think maybe it's helpful to you say one of the things that was important then in the creation of PayPal was, uh, was, was kind of how it started because initially, the, the initial thought was for, with PayPal was to create an agglomeration of financial services so to so have one place where all of your financial services needs would be seamlessly integrated and, um, and, and work smoothly. And then we had like a little feature which was to do email payments. Um, and whenever we'd show the, show the system off to someone, uh, we'd show the hard part, which was the, um, the agglomeration of financial services, which was quite difficult to, to put together. Nobody was interested. Um, then we'd show people email payments, which was actually quite easy, and everybody was interested. So we focused on email payments and really tried to make that work, and, and that's what really got things to take off. Um, but but if, we hadn't, if we hadn't responded to what people said, then we, we, we probably would not have been successful. So it, it's important to look for things like that, and, and focus on them when, when, you, when you see them and you correct uh, your, your prior assumptions. Go, going from PayPal, I thought, well, what, what are some of the, the, the other problems that uh, are likely to most affect the, the future of humanity? Um, it really wasn't from the perspective of what, what's the rank ordered best way to, to make money, um, which, which, is, which is okay, but um, it, it was really w w what I think is going to most affect the future of humanity. So, the, I think the, the biggest terrestrial problem we've got is uh, sustainable energy, but the production and consumption of energy in a sustainable manner. If we don't solve that this, this century, this, this century we're, we're in deep trouble. Um, and then the, the other one being the extension of life beyond Earth to make life multiplanetary. When I started SpaceX, um, I, it, it actually, it, initially 
I thought that, well, there's, there's no way one could possibly start a rocket company. I, I wasn't that crazy. Um, but, but then uh, I, I thought, well, what is a way to um, increase NASA's budget? That was actually my initial goal. So, so obviously the, the financial outcome from such a mission would probably be zero. Um, so anything better than that was on the upside. So I actually went to, I went to Russia three times to, to look at buying um, a refurbished ICBM. And uh, I can tell you it was very weird going there in, in 2000, late 2001, 2002, going to the, the Russian rocket forces and saying, I'd like to buy two of your biggest rockets, uh, but you can keep the nuke. And after making several trips to, to Russia, I, I came to the conclusion that, that actually uh, uh, my, my initial impression was, was wrong about, uh, that, because my initial thought was, well, that, that there's not enough will to explore and expand beyond Earth and have a Mars base and that kind of thing. But I came to the conclusion that that, that was wrong. Um, in fact, there's plenty of will, particularly in the United States, uh, because the United States is a nation of explorers, of people who came here from, from other parts of the world. I think the United States is really a, distil a distillation of the, the spirit of human exploration. So af after my third trip, I said, okay, well, we, what we really need to do here is try to solve the, the space transport problem and, uh, and started SpaceX. Um, and uh, this, this was against the advice of pretty much everyone I talked to. Um, my one friend made me sit down and watch a bunch of videos of rockets blowing up. Let me tell you, he wasn't far wrong. It was tough going there in the beginning uh, because I'd never built anything physical. I mean, I'd built like little model rockets as a kid and that kind of thing, but um, I'd never had a company that built anything physical. So I had to kind of figure out how to, how to do all these things and, and bring together the right team of people. We did all that and, and then failed three times. Um, it, it, it was tough, tough going. Um, because the thing about a rocket is that the, the, the passing grade is 100%. You don't get to actually test the rocket in the real environment that it's going to be in. So I think so the best analogy for, for rocket engineering is, is like if you want to create a really com complicated bit of software, um, you, you can't run the software as an integrated whole, and you can't run it on the computer it's intended to run on. But the first time you put it all together and run it on that computer, it must run with no bugs. The, the first launch, I was picking up bits of rocket near the in the launch site, it was a bit sad. But we, we, we learned with, with each successive flight and, uh, and we're able to, with, uh, eventually with the fourth flight in 2008, uh, reach orbit. And that was also with the last bit of money that we had. So, that, so we, we got the Falcon 1 to orbit and then uh, began to scale that up to, to the Falcon 9, which is um, about an order of magnitude more a thrust. It's uh, around a million pounds of thrust. And we managed to get that to orbit and then uh, developed a Dragon spacecraft, uh, which um, recently was able to dock and return to Earth from the space station. So it's a huge relief. Still can't quite believe it actually happened. Um, but, but there's a lot more that, ha that, that, that must happen beyond this in order for humanity to, be, to become a spacefaring civilization, ultimately um, a multi-planet species. Um, and that's something I think it's, it's, it's vitally important and, and I hope um, that, that some of you will, will participate in, in that, either at SpaceX or, or at other companies, because it's just really one of the, the, the most important things for the preservation and extension of consciousness. Um, I mean, it's worth noting, as I'm sure people are aware, that the Earth has been around for four billion years, and uh, civilization, at least in terms of having um, writing, has been around for 10,000 years, and that's being generous. Um, so uh, it's it's really uh, it's somewhat of a tenuous existence that, that uh, um, civilization and, and consciousness as, as we know it has, has been on Earth. And I think, um, I, I'm, actually, I'm actually fairly optimistic about the future of Earth, so I don't want to, I don't want to sort of people to have the wrong impression that I think we're all about to die. Um, I, I, think, I, think we'll, I think things will most likely be okay for a, for a long time on Earth. But not, not for sure, but most likely. Um, <laughs> Um, but, but even if it's, if it's sort of 99% likely, a 1% 1, 1 chance is still, it's still worth uh, spending a fair bit of effort to ensure that we have, um, we've backed up the biosphere, you know, planetary redundancy, if you will. Um, and, uh, and so I think, I think it's really, really quite important. Um, 
And in, in order to do that, th there's a breakthrough that needs to occur, which is to create a, a rapidly and completely reusable um, transport system to Mars, um, which, which is one of those things that's right on the borderline of, 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 of impossible. Um, but that, that's sort of the, the thing that we're, we're going to try to achieve there with, with, with SpaceX. When, when I was a kid, I was wondering kind of what's the meaning of life? Like, why are we here? What's it all about? And um, I came to the conclusion that uh, what, what really matters is trying to understand the right questions to ask. And th the more that we can increase the scope and scale of uh, human consciousness, the better we are able to ask these questions. So, so I think that there are certain things that are necessary to ensure that the future is good. Um, and some of those things are, in the long term, having long-term sustainable transport and sustainable energy generation. Um, and uh, to be a space-bearing civilization and for humanity to be out there among the stars and be a multi-planetary uh, species. Um, I mean, I think being a multi-planet species and being out there among the stars is important for uh, the long-term survival of humanity. And uh, that's one reason, kind of like life insurance for life collectively, life as we know it. Um, but then the part that I find personally most motivating is that it creates a sense of adventure and it makes people excited about the future. Um, you know, if you consider two futures, one where uh, we are forever confined to Earth until eventually something terrible happens, or another future where we are out there on many planets, maybe even going beyond the solar system, um, I think that second version is incredibly exciting and inspiring, and there need to be reasons to get up in the morning. You know, life can't just be about solving problems. Otherwise, what's the point? There's got to be things that people find inspiring uh, and make life worth living. You're 47. What is the likelihood that you personally will go to Mars? 70 percent. We've recently made a number of breakthroughs that, I, that I'm just really fired up about. And when does that happen? In our lifetimes? Yeah, yeah. I'm talking about moving there. So it's like, so if it, it, you get the price per ticket maybe around a couple hundred thousand dollars. This could be an escape hatch for rich people. No. Your probability of dying on Mars is much higher than Earth. Really, the after going to Mars would be like Shackleton's after going to the Antarctic. It's going to be hard. Uh, there's a good chance of death. Going in a little can through deep space. You might land successfully. Once you land successfully, there will be a map. You'll be working nonstop to build the base. Uh, so there's you know, not much time for leisure. And uh, once you get there, even after doing all this, uh, it's a very harsh environment. So there's a good chance you die there. Um, we think you can come back, but we're not sure. Now, does that sound like an escape hatch for rich people? And yet you would unhesitatingly go. You know, there's lots of people that climb mountains. You know why they climb mountains? Because people die on Mount Everest all the time. They like doing it for the challenge. I, th I think that the probable, probable outcome for civilization is, on Earth is, is quite, quite good for a long time. Um, but I still think that we should uh, try to extend life beyond Earth and have a, and the thing to do is to establish a base on Mars and, ultimate, and, and try to make that a self-sustaining base as soon as possible. Um, so, uh, I mean, I don't expect that SpaceX is gonna do that sort of single-handedly, but I think we're, we're, we're gonna try to advance the technology of space travel to the point where um, we can at least send some number of people to Mars, which is not currently possible. On the Tesla front, uh, the, the goal with Tesla was really to try to show that what, what electric cars can do, because people had the wrong impression. We had to um, change people's perception of an electric vehicle, because they used to think of it as something that was slow and ugly and had low range, kind of like a golf cart. Um, and and we, so that's why we created the Tesla Roadster to show that you can be fast, um, attractive, and, and long range. Um, and, and it's amazing how um, even though you can show that something works on paper, uh, you know, and, and the calculations are very clear, until you actually have the physical object and they can, they can drive it, it doesn't really sink in for people. Um, and so that, that I think is, is something worth noting. If, if you're going to create a company, the first thing you should try to do is create a working prototype. 
Um, you know, everything, everything looks great on PowerPoint. <laughs> you, can, you can make anything work on PowerPoint. Um, but if you, have a, if you have an actual demonstration article, even if it's in primitive form, that's much, much more effective for convincing people. Now is the time to overrule this administration's pledge to mediocrity. Listen, Tesla's a sell, sell, sell. You don't want to own this stock. You shouldn't even rent the darn thing. Why? Because beyond the hype, there's just not much going on here. Tesla still has yet to turn a profit. That'll be a $1.5 billion company with no profit. Its most recent quarter actually lost more money than it did the year before, $1.5 billion, losing more money than the year before. This is a company with limited visibility. You put $90 billion, like 50 years worth of breaks, into, into solar and wind, to, to, to Solyndra and Fisker and Tesla and Enter One. I mean, I, I had a friend who said, you don't just pick the winners and losers, you pick the losers. Private enterprise will not ever lead a space frontier. Not because I don't want them to, but my read of history, t history tells me they can't. It's not possible. And one of the biggest mistakes people generally make, and I'm guilty of it too, is wishful thinking. You know, like you want something to be true, even if it isn't true. Um, and so you ignore the things that, uh, you, you ignore the real truth because of what you want to be true. Um, this is a very difficult trap to avoid. Um, and like I said, it's certainly one that I uh, find myself in having problems with. But if you just take that approach of you're always to some degree wrong and your goal is to be less wrong and, and solicit critical feedback, particularly from friends. Like friends, particularly friends, if somebody loves you, they want the best for you. They don't want to tell you the bad things. Um, so you have to ask them you know, and said, really, I, I really do want to know. Um, if you were 22 today, what would the five problems that you would think about working on be? Um, well, first of all, I, th I think um, if, if somebody is doing something that is useful to the, the rest of society, I think that's a good thing. Like, it doesn't have to change the world. Like, you know, um, if you're doing something that has high value to, to people, um, and, and frankly, even if it's something, if it's like um, just a little game um, or you know, the, some improvement in photo sharing or something. If it, if it, has, if it has a small amount of, of good uh, for a large number of people, um, that's, I mean, I think that's, that's fine. Like, stuff doesn't need to be changed the world just to be good. Um, uh, but, it, you know, in terms of things that I think are most likely to affect the, the future of humanity, I think um, AI is probably the single biggest item in the near term that's likely to affect uh, humanity. So. It's very important that we have the advent of AI uh, in a good way. That that uh, is something that, um, if you if you could look into the crystal ball and, and see the future, you would like you would like that outcome, um, because it is something that could go um, could go wrong, um, as we've talked about many times. Um, and so we really need to make sure it goes right. Um, that's that's I think AI. Working on AI and making sure it's a great future, that's, that's the most important thing I think right now, um, the most pressing item. So, uh, then um, obviously anything to do with, with genetics, um, if you can actually solve um, genetic diseases, um, if you can um, prevent dementia um, or Alzheimer's or something like that, that uh, um, with genetic reprogramming, that would be wonderful. So I think this uh, genetics it might be the sort of second most important item. I think um, having a high bandwidth interface to the, the brain, like um, we're, we're currently bandwidth limited. We, we, we have a digital tertiary self uh, in the form of our email capabilities, our computers, phones, applications. Uh, we're effectively superhuman, um, but we are extremely bandwidth constrained in that interface between the cortex and your sort of uh, that, that tertiary digital form of yourself and um, helping solve that uh, bandwidth constraint uh, would, would be, I think, very important for the future as well. What have you done or what did you do when you were younger that uh, you think sort of set you up to have a big impact? Well, I think first of all I should say that I did not expect to be involved in all these things. So the, 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 the five things that I thought about at the time in, in college, so quite a long time ago, uh, 25 years ago. Um, you know, being, you know, making life multi-planetary, um, 
accelerating, accelerating the transition to sustainable energy, um, the, the internet, broadly speaking, um, and, and then genetics and AI. I think um, I didn't expect to be involved in, 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 in all of those things. I actually, at the time in college, I, I sort of thought um, helping with electrification of, of, of cars was, was how I would start out. And that's, uh, that's actually what I worked on as an intern was um, advanced uh, ultra capacitors with, to see if, they, if there would be a breakthrough relative to batteries for energy storage in, in cars. And then when I came out to go to Stanford, um, that's what I was going to be doing my grad studies on is, um, is was working on advanced uh, uh, energy storage uh, technologies for electric cars. And then I put that on hold to start an internet company in, in 95 because um, th 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 there does seem to be like a time for particular technologies uh, when they're at uh, a steep point in the inflection curve. And, um, and I didn't want to you know, do a PhD at Stanford and then and watch it all happen. Um, and then, and, and I wasn't entirely certain that the technology I'd be working on would actually succeed. Um, like you can get, you can get a, you know, doctorate on many things that ultimately are not, do not have a practical bearing on the world. Um, and I wanted to, you know, just, I, I really was just trying to be useful. That's the optimization. It's like, what, what, are the, what can I do that would actually be useful? How, how should someone figure out how they can be most useful? Whatever this thing is that you're trying to create, what would what would be the um, utility delta compared to the current state of the art times how many people it would affect? So that's why I think um, having something that has a that that has a makes makes a big difference but affects a sort of small to moderate number of people is great. As is something that makes even a small difference but it, but affects a vast number of people. When you're uh, trying to estimate probability of success, so you say this thing will be really useful, good mm -hmm. area under the curve. Uh, I guess to use the example of SpaceX, mm -hmm. when you made the go decision that you were actually going to do that, this was kind of a very crazy thing at the time. Very um, crazy, very for crazy. sure. <laughs> yeah, uh, people are not shy about saying that. Um, but I kind of agree, I agreed with them that it was quite crazy. It, crazy if, um, if, the, if the objective was um, to achieve the um, best risk adjusted return, um, starting a rocket company is insane. Um, but that was not that was not my objective. I I I'd simply come to the conclusion um, that if something didn't happen to improve rocket technology, we'd be stuck on Earth forever. Um, and um, and the big aerospace companies had just had no interest in radical innovation. Um, all they wanted to do was try to make their old technology slightly better every year. And in fact, um, sometimes it would actually get worse. Um, and particularly in rockets, it's pretty bad. Like the in, in 69, we were able to go to the moon um, with a Saturn V, and then the space shuttle could only take people to low Earth orbit, and then the space shuttle retired. I mean, that, that trend is basically trends to zero. It, um, it, people sometimes think technology just automatically gets better every year, but it actually doesn't. It only gets better if smart people work, work like crazy to make it better. That's how any technology actually gets better. And by itself, technology, if, if people don't work on it, actually will decline. Um, I mean, you can look, and look at the history of civilizations, many civilizations, and, and look at, say, um, ancient Egypt, where they were able to build these incredible pyramids, and then they, they basically forgot how to build pyramids. Um, and, um, and then even hieroglyphics, they, they forgot how to read hieroglyph hieroglyphics. So you look at Rome, and how they were able to, to build these incredible roadways and aqueducts and, and indoor plumbing, and they forgot how to do all of those things. And um, there are many such examples in, in history. Um, so I. I think um, I should always bear in mind uh, that you know en entropy is not on your side. You may have heard me say to th that it's good to think in terms of the, the physics approach of first principles, uh, which is rather than reasoning by analogy, you boil things down to the most fundamental truths you can imagine, and you reason up from there. And this is a good way to figure out if. If, if something really makes sense, or if it's just what everybody else is doing. Um, it, it, it's hard to think that way. You can't think, think that way about everything. It takes a lot of effort. Uh, but if you're trying to do something new, it's the best way to think. Um, and that framework was developed by, by physicists to figure out counterintuitive things, um, like quantum mechanics. So it's really a powerful, powerful method. How do you think about making a decision when everyone tells you this is a crazy idea? Or where do you get the internal strength to do that? 
Uh, well, first of all, I'd say I actually think I, I think I fear, feel fear quite strongly. Um, so it's not as though I just have the absence of fear. I, I feel it quite strongly. Um, but there, there are just times when something is important enough, you believe in it enough, that you, you do it in spite of the fear. People should think, well, I feel fear about this and therefore I shouldn't do it. Um, it's normal to, be, to feel fear. Like you'd have to definitely do something mentally wrong <laughs> if you didn't feel fear. If you have an advice to them, young people globally who want to be like Elon Musk, what's your advice to them? I think that probably they shouldn't want to be. <laughs> <laughs> you? <laughs> it, it, I think it sounds better than it is. Okay. Yeah, it's uh, not as much fun being me as you'd think. I don't know. You don't think so? No. There's definitely, it could be worse for sure. <laughs> but it's, um, I, I'm not sure I would, I'm not sure I want to be me. So when everybody leaves, it's just Elon sitting at home, brushing his teeth, just a bunch of ideas bouncing around in your head. When did you realize that that's not the case with most people? I think when I was, I don't know, five or six or something. I thought I was insane. It was just strange. Because it was clear that other people did not, would, their mind wasn't exploding with ideas. It was like, hmm, I'm strange. I don't think, I don't think you'd necessarily want to be me. People would like it that much. It's very hard to turn it off. It's like a never ending explosion. All the time. What do you think the odds of the Mars colony are at this point today? Well, um, oddly enough, I actually think they're pretty good. At this point, I am certain there is a way. I'm certain that success is one of the possible outcomes for establishing a self-sustaining Mars colony, in fact, a growing Mars colony. I'm certain that that is possible. Um, whereas until maybe a few years ago, I was not sure that success was even one of the possible outcomes. It's a meaningful number of people going to Mars. I, th I think this is potentially something that can be accomplished in about 10 years, um, maybe sooner, uh, maybe nine years. Um, I need to make sure that SpaceX doesn't die between now and then, and that I don't die, or if I do die, that someone takes over who will continue that. You shouldn't go on the first launch. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The best of the available alternatives that I can come up with, and maybe somebody else can come up with a better approach uh, or, or better outcome, is that uh, we achieve democratization of AI technology, meaning that uh, no one company or a uh, small set of individuals has control over advanced AI technology. I think that that's very dangerous. Um, it could also get stolen by somebody bad, you know, like some evil dictator of a country could send their intelligence agency to go steal it and gain control. It just becomes a very unstable situation, I think, if you've got any, um, any incredibly powerful AI. Um, you just don't know who's who's going to control that. So it's not as though I think that the risk is that the AI would develop a will of its own right off the bat. I think it's more that's, uh, the concern is that some, someone um, may use it in a way that is bad. Um, or, or, and even if they weren't going to use it in a way that's bad, that somebody could take it from them and use it in a way that's bad. That, that I think is quite a big danger. So I think we must have democratization of AI technology and make it widely available. Um, and that's you know the reason that obviously uh, the rest of the team uh, you know created OpenAI um, was to help uh, with the democracy help help spread out um, AI technology so it doesn't get concentrated in the hands of a few. Um, and, and but then that, of course that needs to be um, combined with uh, solving the high bandwidth interface to the cortex. Um, humans are so slow. Humans are so slow. Yes, exactly. But you know, we we already have a, a situation in our brain where we've got the cortex and the limbic system, and the li limbic system is, is kind of the I mean, that's that's the primitive brain. It's kind of like the your in, your instincts and um, whatnot. And then the cortex is the thinking upper part of the brain. Those two seem to work together quite well. Um, occasionally, your cortex and limbic system may disagree. Generally, it works pretty well, and it's like rare to find someone who 
I, I've not found someone who wishes to either get rid of their cortex or get rid of their limbic system. So I think if, if we can effectively uh, um, merge with uh, AI by um, improving that uh, the, the, the neural link between your cortex and the the, the your digital extension of yourself, which already, like I said, already exists, just has a bandwidth issue, um, and then then effectively um, you become an, an, an AI human symbiote, um, and and if that then is widespread with anyone who wants it can have it, uh, then we solve the control problem as well. Um, we don't have to worry about um, some sort of evil dictator AI um, because kind of we are the AI um, collectively. That seems like the best outcome I can think of. I think we've got a really talented group at OpenAI. Yeah, a really, really talented team and they're working hard. Um, OpenAI is structured as uh, see a, a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, but you know, many nonprofits uh, do not have a sense of urgency. It's fine; they don't have to have a sense of urgency. Um, but OpenAI does, because um, I think people really believe in the mission. I think it's important, um, and it's it's about minimizing um, the risk of uh, existential harm um, in the future. And uh, so I, I think it's going well. I'm pretty impressed with what people are doing and the ta talent level. And obviously, we're always looking for um, great people to join. When I interview somebody, I really just ask them to tell me the story of their career and what they, you know, what are some of the tougher problems that they dealt with, how they dealt with those, and um, how they made decisions at key transition points. And usually, that's enough for me to get a very good gut feel about someone. And um, and, and what I'm really looking for is evidence of exceptional ability. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, did, did they face really difficult problems and overcome them? Um, and, and then of course you want to make sure that, that if, if there was some significant accomplishment, were they really responsible or was somebody else more responsible? And uh, you know, usually the person who's had to struggle with the problem, they really understand it you know, they don't, and they don't forget yeah. <laughs> you know, if it was very difficult. So um, you can ask them Detailed, very detailed questions about it, and they will they will know the answer. Okay, Whereas yeah. the person who was not truly responsible for um, that accomplishment uh, will not know the details. There's no need even to have a college degree at all, uh, or even high school. I mean, if somebody graduated from a great university, that may be an that may be an indication that they will be capable of great things, but it's not necessarily the case. Um, you know, if you look at um, say people like. Uh, Bill Gates, or Larry Ellison, Steve Jobs, these guys didn't graduate from college. But if you had a chance to hire them, of course, that would be a good idea. So, you know, just looking just for evidence of exceptional ability. Um, and if there's a track record of exceptional achievement, then it's likely that that will continue into the future. What sort of things do you look for in people or in processes that make the workforce better? Well, I think. The massive thing that can be done is to make sure your incentive structure is such that uh, innovation is rewarded and lack of innovation is punished. So you've got to be a carrot and a stick. So uh, if somebody is innovating um, and doing, ma making good, good progress, then they should be promoted sooner. Um, and if somebody is completely failing to innovate, um, not, not every role requires innovation, but uh, if they're in a role where innovation is should be happening and it's not happening, then they should either not be promoted or exited. And let me tell you, you'll get promoted, you'll get you'll, you'll you'll get innovation real fast. Does that carrot and stick approach help? Uh, do you think people be more risk averse or less risk averse? When trying different things, you you got to have some acceptance of failure. Failure must be an option. If failure is not an option, it's going to result in extremely conservative choices, and you, you, may, not, you may get something even worse than lack of innovation. Things may go backwards. What you really want is, you want reward and punishment to be, to be proportionate to the actions that you seek. So if, uh, if, if what you're seeking is innovation, then you should reward success and innovation, um, and only there should be 
minor consequences for lack of minor consequences for for trying and failing. There, there should be minor. Um, with a significant rewards for trying and succeeding, m minor consequences for trying and not succeeding, um, and big and, and, and major negative consequences for not trying. If you have that incentive structure, you will get innovation like you can't believe. The purpose of Neuralink, like, uh, what are we? What's our goal? Our goal is to solve important spine and brain problems with a seamlessly seamlessly implant, implanted device. So, you want to have a device that you can basically uh, put in your head um, and feel and look totally normal, uh, but it solves uh, some some important problem um, in your brain or spine. So, uh, going into the Neuralink architecture, what we've done over the past year is dramatically simplify the device. So we, 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 about a year ago, we had a device which uh, had m multiple parts, including a piece that it had to sort of sit behind your ear. Um, and it was, it, was, it was complex, and you, and you wouldn't still look totally normal. You'd have a thing behind your ear. So um, we've simplified this to simply something that is uh, about the size of a large coin. Um, and it, it goes uh, in your skull, replaces a piece of skull, um, and the wires uh, uh, then, then connect uh, within a few centimeters or about an inch away from the device. Um, and this is sort of what it looks like. This is our little device. I mean, fr frankly, to, to sort of simplify this, uh, what, what we're, <laughs> I mean, it's more complicated than this, but it's, in a lot of ways, it's kind of like a Fitbit in your skull with tiny wires. Uh, uh, current prototype, version 0.9, has about a thousand channels, uh, so that's you know, about a hundred times better than the, the next best um, uh, consumer device that's available. And it's a 23 millimeters by 8 millimeters. It actually uh, fits quite nicely in your skull, because your, your skull is about 10 millimeters thick. So uh, it fits, it's, it goes flush with your skull, it's invisible, and all you can see afterwards is this tiny scar. And if it's under your hair, you can't see it at all. In fact, I could have it Neuralink right now, and you wouldn't know. It's also inductively charged, so um, it's charged in the same way that you, char you charge a smartwatch or a phone. Um, and so you can use it all day, uh, charge it at night, and have full functionality. So you would really, um, you know, it would be, it would be completely seamless, uh, and uh, yeah, no wires. Uh, in terms of getting a link, so that, um, we, you need to have the device uh, a great device, and you also need to have a great robot that uh, puts in the, uh, the electrodes and uh, does the surgery. So you want the surgery to be as, as automated uh, and, and as possible, and the only way you can achieve the level of precision that's needed is with an advanced robot. Uh, the link procedure, the, the installation of a link, done in under an hour. Um, so you can basically go in in the morning and leave the hospital in the afternoon. And it can be done without general anesthesia. So this is our surgical robot. And we actually ultimately want this robot to do uh, essentially the entire surgery. Uh, so in, in everything from, from in, incision, uh, removing the, the skull, inserting the electrodes, placing the device, um, and then um, closing things up and having you ready to, to leave. So we want to have a fully automated system. How do you spend your days now? Like what, what do you mm -hmm. allocate most of your time to? My time is mostly split uh, well, it's between SpaceX and, and, and Tesla, and of course, I, I try to spend um, uh, it's a part of every week at OpenAI. Um, so I spend most, I spend basically half a day at OpenAI most weeks, um, and then, and then I have some OpenAI stuff that happens during the week. I think a lot of people think I, I must spend a lot of time with media or, or on businessy things, but actually, almost. Uh, almost all my time, like 80% of it is spent on engineering and design. I engineering and design, so it's um, developing next generation product, at, that's 80% of it. I think a lot of people think I'm kind of a business person or something, which is fine, like business is fine, but um, like I, uh, but really it's, you know, it's like it's SpaceX, uh, Gwyn Shotwell is Chief Operating Officer, she kind of manages um, uh, legal, finance, um, sales, um, and kind of general business activity. And then my time is almost entirely with the uh, engineering team working on improving our, 
the, the Falcon 9 and the uh, Dragon spacecraft and developing the Mars colonial architecture. Um, and then at, at Tesla, it's working on the Model 3 and the, you know, some in the design studio, typically um, half a day a week, um, dealing with this aesthetics and, and uh, look and feel things. And, and then most of the rest of the week is just going through engineering of, of, of the car itself, as well as engineering of the, the factory. Because um, the, the, the biggest epiphany I've had is that uh, what really matters is the, is the machine that builds the machine, the factory. Um, and this, that is at least towards magnitude hotter than the vehicle itself. What are the scenarios that scare you most? Humanity really is not evolved to think of existential threats in general. We're evolved to think about things that are very close to us, near term, to, to be upset with other humans, and, and not, not to really to think about things that could destroy humanity as a whole. Um, but then in recent decades, recent, just really in the last century, we had nu nuclear bombs, which are, could potentially destroy civilization, obviously. Uh, we have AI, which could destroy civilization. Uh, we have global warming, which could destroy civilization, or, or at least severely disrupt uh, civilization. Um, Excuse me, how could AI mm -hmm. destroy civilization? You know, it would be something in the same way that humans destroyed the habitat of primates. I mean, it, it, it wouldn't necessarily be destroyed, but we might be relegated to a small corner of the world. When Homo sapiens became much smarter than other primates, I pushed all the other ones into small habitats. Couldn't AI, even in this moment, just with the technology that we have before us, be used in some fairly destructive ways? You could make a swarm of assassin drones for very little money by just taking the, the, the Face ID chip that's used in cell phones and uh, having a small explosive charge and a, and a standard drone and have them just do a grid sweep of the building until they find the person they're looking for, ram into them and, ex and explode. You can do that right now. No extra, no new technology is needed right now. People just think this stuff is of, of sci-fi novels and movies and it's so far away, but yeah. every time I hear you speak, it's like, well, no, this stuff is sitting, it's, it's right here. Probably a bigger risk than, than being hunted down by a, a drone is that uh, AI would be used to make incredibly effective propaganda. Uh, that would not seem like pro propaganda. So these are deep fakes? Yeah, influence the direction of society influence elections, artificial intelligence. Just hones the message, hones the message, check, looks, at the feed, looks at the feedback, makes this message slightly better. Within milliseconds, it, could, it can um, adapt its message and, and shift and react to news. And, and there's so many uh, social media accounts out there that are not people. Like, how, how, do you, how do you know it's a person, not a person? People look like they have a much better life than they really do. People are posting pictures of when they're really happy. They're modifying those pictures to be better looking. Um, even if they're not modifying the pictures, they're at least selecting the pictures for the best lighting, the best angle. So people basically seem uh, uh, they're way better looking than they basically really are. Um, and they're way happier seeming than they really are. So if you look at everyone on Instagram, you might think, man, there are all these happy, beautiful people, and I'm not that good looking, and I'm not happy. So I'm a suck, you know, and that's gonna make people sad. When in fact, those people you think are super happy, actually, not that happy. Some of them are really depressed. They're very sad. Some of the happiest seeming people, actually some of the saddest people in reality. So I think, I think things like that can make people quite sad. This may sound corny, but love is the answer. Wouldn't hurt to have more love in the world. I think, you know, I think people should be nicer to each other and give, people, and give, give more credit to, to others and don't assume that they're mean until you know they're actually mean. You know, just, it's easy to demonize people. You're usually wrong about it. People are nicer than you think. Give people more credit. There's going to be some amount of failure. But you, you want your net output, net useful output to be maximized. Failure is, 
essentially irrelevant unless it is catastrophic. The final thing I would encourage you to do is now is the time to take risk. As you get older, your obligations increase. So you, the, and once you have a family, you start taking risk not just for yourself but for your family as well. It gets much harder to uh, do things that might not work out. Um, so now is the time to, to do that. Uh, before you, before you have those obligations. So I would, I would encourage you to take risks now, do something bold. Um, you won't regret it.